I'm Jim Perkins, and uh, I welcome you to the first uh, in the OLLI program series, Foreign Culture and American Foreign Policy. Uh, there are a couple of logistics items that we need to take care of for this program. Uh, one, an important one, right back through that central door or the restrooms if you need to use the facilities. And please take this opportunity to turn off all cell phones and electronic devices. And I wish to inform you that we are video recording all of the programs, including the question and answer session. The videos will be used for educational purposes only. And our school systems uh, have requested uh, the use of these videos, including uh, UVA. Now, if you object to being shown in any of the videos, please see me uh, after the program concludes. We will have a question and answer session at the conclusion of Professor Quant's presentation, as the professors have agreed to video these as well, because these question and answer sessions can be an important part of the information provided. If you have a question, please, uh, at the conclusion of Professor Quant's uh, uh, items, if you would queue up here at this uh, microphone and make sure that uh, you use the microphone since we need to pick it up for the video recording. So that way we'll get the question and we'll also get Professor Quant's response. At this time, I want to acknowledge the students from Western Albemarle High School from their AP Comparative Government class. These students are here, compliments of Ali, and through the kind permission of the superintendent of the Albemarle County Schools, Pam Moran, as arranged by Jennifer Sublette, who's with us today, the facilitator of the social studies. Now, for some background, I thought I would give you uh, a little background as to how this program originated. We'll set the stage. During my 25 years naval career, I traveled to many foreign countries, and I was struck by how little I knew about the true culture of these countries. I was concerned about us as Americans and our relations with the people in whose country we were a guest. As more and more countries became increasingly important to the United States due to global economies and conflicts, some of which were actual combat situations, I was even more concerned about our foreign policies about how the knowledge, or lack thereof, about their cultures was affecting our day-to-day -day relations with the people our di diplomats, tourists, servicemen, and women came in contact. Two years ago, in March 2010, I attended a forum at Monticello that was inspired and originated by Dr. Rui Ramazani, the Edward R. Statinius Professor Emeritus of Government and Foreign Affairs Department of Politics at the University of Virginia. The forum was conducted by the American Academy of Diplomacy out of Washington, D.C. and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation for Monticello. The uh, foundation uh, put on this program and the attendance was with many ambassadors, uh, most of whom were retired, but experts from their various regions. Dr. Ra Ramazani emphasized then the need in the United States for cultural education related to foreign policy making. The following fall, in September uh, 2010, Ambassador Ryan Crocker spoke at the Miller Center. He clearly stated that one of the lessons we must learn when dealing with foreign countries with whom we are about to engage in military conflict is, be careful what you get into. Know the history. Know how it is perceived in the country. Know how it, the history, informs the present within the minds of the people, people we are going to be dealing with. Know the culture, and above all, know the language. Know the literature, the fiction, the poetry, the fairy tales, and what myths the parents tell their children. Now these two presentations triggered in me the idea that education was clearly needed to inform the public. And working as a volunteer with Ollie, I thought that this was a natural place to start. I approached Professor Ramazani about my idea of a program at Ali and asked his support. He responded by stating, and I quote, I would be happy to advise on what I call the cultural, culture deficit in United States foreign policy making. To overcome this daunting predicament, your idea of a course or a program at Ali would be a great start. I proposed the idea to Ali program chair, Elliot Minenberg, whose committee approved the concept. And Dr. Ramazani contacted Dr. Alan Lynch at the UVA Department of Politics, 
who obtained five more professors, experts in their respective countries and cultures. And with a lot of hard work by Joan Kumeyer and her staff, we have the six-week program, Foreign Cultures. It's now my pleasure to honor, uh, in honor to introduce Professor William Kwan. Professor Kwan is the Edward R. Statinius Professor of Politics at UVA, a post he has held since he joined the Department of Politics in 1994. He succeeded Professor Rui Ramazani as the Statinius Chair. From 2000 to 2003, he also served as Vice Provost for International Affairs at the University. He teaches courses on the Middle East and American foreign policy. Prior to this appointment, he was the senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies Program at the Brookings Institution, where he conducted research on the Middle East, American policy toward the Arab-Israeli conflict, and energy policy. Professor Kwan is considered an internationally recognized expert on Egypt and has traveled there several times since the Arab Spring Uprising. Now, before going to Brookings, Dr. Quant as a staff member, was a staff member on the National Security Council. He was actively involved in the negotiations that led to the Camp David Accords and the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty. Dr. Quant was also an associate professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania, where he worked at the Rand Corporation in the Department of Social Science. And he also taught at UCLA and MIT. Bill Kwan has written numerous books and his articles have appeared in a wide variety of publications. His books include Peace Process, American Diplomacy, and the Arab-Israeli Conflict since 1967, and the United States and Egypt, an essay on policy for the 1990s. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and serves on the Board of Trustees of the American University in Cairo and the Foundation for the Middle East Peace. In 2004, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 2005, received the All-University Teaching Award at UVA. Dr. Quant was born in Los Angeles, California. He received his BA in International Relations at Stanford University, and his PhD in Political Science from MIT in 1968. He is married to the writer Helena Coran, has one daughter, two stepchildren, and lives here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Please welcome Professor William Tom. Thank you very much. If you can get that turned on for me. <laughs> Look, a little technical problem here. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Jim, for the introduction, and thank you for organizing this, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, what I'm going to try to do in the time we have together is to give you a, a sense of what's happening in Egypt today. It's a country that's going through a lot of dramatic change, um, but I also want to give you a little bit of background about the country. Uh, this is a country that thinks of its own history as uh, dating back at least 5,000 years. Now, I promise that I will not go through uh, year by year that uh, long history, but I do want to give you a little bit of a sense of how Egypt uh, e emerged as a modern country, uh, because it, without that kind of background, I think you, you won't appreciate uh, some of the kinds of issues that Egyptians are, are trying to struggle with today. Uh, how many of you have ever, ever been to Egypt? Oh, well, that's a good number, great. So you've got a visual image of uh, the place and probably a fair amount of background. Uh, that, that makes my task a bit e easier. For those of you who haven't been, uh, the introduction will perhaps uh, uh, help situate uh, Egypt historically and geographically. Of course, it's, it's, it's very uh, strategically located, which is, uh, one of the reasons that it attracted a lot of attention uh, in recent years uh, by outside powers who had interests in this broader region. But if you were to have gone back several thousand years and had a comparable map to the one you had today, you would have basically seen that there were two great areas where civilizations came into being 
uh, at a very, very early date. And one was the Nile River, River Valley, and the other was the Fertile Crescent area. These were the two areas in the Middle East region where civilizations began to emerge uh, because you had settled populations that had enough surplus to begin to build cities and monuments and develop written languages and so forth. And Egypt was one of these two great centers of civilization uh, in the Middle East, dating back uh, to about 3000 BC. Yes, it works. This is the map of, of modern Egypt. You can see it's a, uh, basically the, the major cities are all uh, located along the, the Nile River. And then as it opens up into the Delta, uh, you get a, a fairly uh, dense population in this area and then a few cities along the coast. But basically, uh, Egypt is uh, the Nile River. Without the Nile River, this would be one very large desert. Uh, don't pay too much attention to these green spots. These are not very inhabited. Egypt is today and always has been this very, very narrow strip. And then it, as the delta opens up, you have a somewhat larger area of uh, cultivation. And the thing that has made Egypt uh, the country that it is is the fact that the Nile River historically um, was a very predictable <clears throat> source of both water and topsoil, so that every year when you would have floods in Egypt, it would not only bring a lot of water onto the land, but it would bring new uh, topsoil from, <clears throat> uh, from other parts of Africa that came down in the river and gave a kind of natural fertility to the soil. And as a result, Egyptian peasants could grow three or four crops a year because uh, you've got tons of sunshine and lots of water and very uh, fertile land. And it was that that made this particular little area uh, relatively wealthy in terms of agricultural surpluses and gave government a very clear uh, justification because in order to make all of this work, uh, you had to have regulation uh, of the water uh, and governments uh, dating back thousands of years have seen as one of their major jobs in Egypt the regulation of water and provision of seeds. Uh, and by and large, Egypt has had some kind of a government that took upon itself uh, these kind of basic uh, societal functions from a very early time on, whether it was the, uh, the pharaoh or the pharaoh's uh, descendants. But we, Egypt has, has had a relatively strong tradition of governance uh, and a very strong sense of a state the state was integrally tied to people's well-being. And when there was order and prosperity, uh, ordinary Egyptians benefited. And when there was a breakdown, uh, things would get desperate. You could, you could have starvation. Uh, and so orderliness and looking to the state to manage certain basic functions is very basic to uh, Egyptian uh, histor history. So just a few uh, starting uh, points about uh, Egypt, as I mentioned, it uh, has uh, uh, a great long sense of, of history. It's one of the few countries you can go to and you see things that are only 2,000 years old and you say, that's not very interesting, that's recent. You know, that's just Cleopatra's time. Uh, that's Roman, that's uh, Ptolemaic. If you really want to see the old stuff, you have to go back uh, and see things that are, are nearly 5,000 years old. Uh, and you can't go to too many places in the world and have that sense of the depth and continuity of, of history. Uh, Herodotus, the uh, famous uh, Greek historian, correctly identified this central role of the, uh, the Nile River, calling Egypt the gift of the Nile. Without the Nile, there would have been no uh, Egyptian civilization. So we have several different layers of civilization that I'm gonna briefly just show you some images of. There is, of course, the the kind of ancient Egyptian pharaonic culture, which we all go to see as tourists, and it really is quite remarkable. Uh, but also, uh, Egypt was the site of some of the very earliest Christian communities. Uh, Christianity took hold in Egypt almost immediately uh, after Christ, uh, St. Mark, uh, one of the apostles, Mark, went to Egypt to uh, preach the Gospels. Uh, and a very uh, early Christian communities started developing uh, in Egypt. And you still today can see um, 
monasteries that date back to the third, third and fourth century. I'm going to briefly show you a picture of a, uh, about an eighth or ninth century uh, painting from uh, early Christianity. So Christianity took hold and spread in, uh, uh, in Egypt. There's a interesting moments when you can see the transition from Pharaonic Egypt to Christianity. Some of the iconography overlaps so that you have um, the ancient Egyptian writing, but also Christian symbols showing up. So Egypt was, was one of the transition areas where Christianity took hold. And Christians are still uh, a part of the uh, Egyptian uh, society. They are no longer uh, anything close to, the, to being a majority, but they make up about 10% of the Egyptian population today. They are, are active in politics and society, and uh, particularly now with a more democratic Egypt, they are insisting that their rights as a minority be respected. Uh, Islam arrived in Egypt uh, early. Uh, it spread out of the Arabian Peninsula very quickly, as you, you probably know. Uh, shortly after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, Islam began to spread, and Egypt was one of the very early places where Islam took root as it spread across North Africa uh, in the 7th and 8th century. And you begin to see uh, Islamic monuments showing up in Egypt in about the 8th and 9th century. The oldest mosques date back to, to that period, which is very early on indeed. So just to give you a couple of visual uh, images, uh, this is probably the oldest uh, stone-built uh, monument in the is still standing anywhere in the world. This is called the Step Pyramid. It's uh, not far from Cairo. Uh, it's not nearly as well known as uh, the slightly younger Great Pyramid, uh, but this was one of the very, very uh, early uh, stone structures in pyramidal form. Uh, of course, less, less uh, famous than the Great Pyramid, which is a couple of hundred years younger. Uh, and the Sphinx, which is quite a bit younger indeed. So these are the iconic pictures that, of course, everybody sees, uh, the sites that, that deservedly are, are world famous, uh, and they're still there. They've been there for almost uh, the entirety of Egypt's history as a, uh, uh, a well-developed uh, civilization. Um, the artwork that uh, you can see when you go to visit things like the tombs in Luxor, where the kings and queens and nobles of Egypt were buried, uh, shows that uh, this is probably three or 4,000 years old, the, the quality of artistic uh, accomplishment that dates back uh, to ancient Egypt was really quite extraordinary. Uh, this is an example of a much more recent uh, kind of art that came out of Egypt. This comes from a, a, about a fourth century uh, <clears throat> monastery near the Red Sea. Uh, this is, was a monastery built where there had been a famous Christian hermit uh, who had lived and been known for his saintly ways, St. Anthony. Uh, and this particular fresco dates to about the ninth century. Uh, and there are, there are later ones as well that they're in remarkably good condition. Uh, and they, they, they give evidence of the very long history of Christianity in Egypt. Uh, Islam, as I said, came early. This is one of the very oldest uh, mosques uh, near, uh, it's, it's actually in Cairo now, but Cairo as a city uh, wasn't founded until about the, the 10th century. This is actually a little earlier. It's a, uh, from an area uh, that was on the outskirts of Cairo at the outset, uh, and it's called the Ibn Tulun Mosque. Uh, the, the architecture has a kind of Iraqi quality to it, this kind of ziggurat, uh, minaret. It's the only one in Egypt of this sort. And this is a, a remarkable mosque that is perfectly intact today uh, and has been uh, a place for, for worship uh, since the, the ninth century. Uh, much more recent, this is of course a painting rather than a, uh, a photograph, is the great uh, Sultan Hassan Mosque, which is uh, in, in the central area of Islamic Cairo. Uh, and uh, it is one of the great achievements of Islamic architecture as well. If you ever go to Egypt, it's, it's well worth visiting. Uh, and it, it was built at the kind of high point of Islamic civil, civilization uh, in Egypt in about the 14th uh, century and combined uh, education, there's a school there, as well as a place of worship. Now that's all 
kind of just a way of getting you to, to, to keep in mind that Egypt has all these different historical layers that are still important. Its Christian identity is important. It's uh, uh, pre-Christian uh, identity. Its ancient civilization is still very visible. And of course, its Islamic uh, roots are uh, extremely important. And at no time has it, that been more important than right now. So I'm going to now jump forward rather uh, quickly into the relatively modern period and just give you a few uh, names and events before we get into the discussion of what's been happening uh, to Egypt uh, very recently. Um, the British uh, assumed control over Egypt as a colonizing power in the late 19th century. This was a period when Europe was strong and was in, ex in an expansive mood. The French were moving into North Africa, the British moved into this part of the Middle East after World War uh, one, of course, they consolidated their hold in other parts of the region, but Egypt came under British control in 1882. Uh, and from 1882 until about the 1950s, let's say 1952, Egypt's security, foreign policy, and some of its internal politics was essentially governed by British governor generals, or uh, the titles changed over time, but the British were essentially in control. And of course, what the British were particularly concerned with was the Suez Canal. Uh, for them, Egypt was a stop on the way to their empire in South Asia, which was India, in South Asia, India, Pakistan today. And to get there by ship, the easiest way to go was through the Suez Canal, which is, uh, goes through Egypt. And so for the British, taking control of Egypt was instrumental for their larger imperial project. But they acquired uh, a stake in Egypt as well. They built military bases there. Uh, they began the introduction of cotton as a, an export crop. And of course, the, the cotton mills of Man, uh, Manchester and, uh, and England were basically fueled, uh, not fueled with, but fed with uh, Egyptian cotton, and it became very important for the industrial uh, wealth of, of England in the 19th century. As everywhere else in the Middle East, the presence of European domination uh, provoked a nationalist reaction. So in the late 19th century, and very obviously so in the early part of the, 19th, of the 20th century, Egypt began to to see an expression of strong nationalist backlash against the British pres presence. Egyptians were proud of their own history. Uh, they were proud of the fact that they had governed themselves as a state for hundreds, thousands of years. Uh, and they, they resented the fact that the British were treating them like people who didn't know how to govern themselves. And so you began to get, particularly from the more educated classes, uh, in the early 19th, 20th century, strong demands for independence, for self-government, and so forth. So for much, about the first half of the 20th century, the British are constantly kind of negotiating with different social and political forces in Egypt. There is a notional uh, Egyptian ruler, the, the Egyptians, the, the, the British leave a king, or later takes the title king originally, it was called the Khedive, uh, who was uh, a, from a traditional family that had ruled before the British arrived. They left him as a figurehead, but without very much real power. But there were times when they tried to build up his power because he was a counterweight to the nationalists. So there were nationalists, there was the king, and then there were the social forces like the Islamic movement that began to grow in the 1920s, which was both anti-British and anti-monarchical. So the British begin gradually in the 1920s and 1930s to give more and more uh, authority to different parts of the emerging uh, Egyptian political system, but still trying to play one off against another with considerable success. And uh, when World War II came, of course, Egypt was extremely important as a military base uh, for the British. They used uh, uh, Egypt as their main military base for uh, the campaign against the Axis powers uh, in the Middle East. There were the 
famous battles in, uh, against Rommel in, uh, uh, in Libya and, and in e e Egyptian deserts. Uh, that was all made possible because Britain still had the upper hand and control over uh, the military uh, uh, resources uh, and, and, uh, of Egypt. After World War II, however, the British were uh, in retreat. They'd given up their, uh, <clears throat> their empire in, in South Asia. Uh, Egypt became less important in their eyes. Uh, they were, uh, the, 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 the um, desire to keep the, the empire as it had been uh, was pretty much ended with uh, the trauma of World War II for the British. And so Egypt in the post-World War II period begins to um, move toward greater and greater uh, real self-government. The real turning point uh, comes in 1952 when a colonel in the Egyptian army named Gamal Abdel Nasser uh, and a group of so-called free officers uh, decide to depose the monarchy, uh, not, not the British monarchy, but their own monarchy, uh, and to start demanding that the, the British uh, leave entirely. This is the first moment in uh, Egypt's modern history when an Egyptian born and bred uh, leader takes power and speaks in the name of the Egyptian people. So Nasser is one of these early um, kind of populist uh, nationalist leaders that become quite uh, recognizable throughout the uh, developing world in this post-World War II period as, as the French and the British and others uh, give up their, their imperial positions, a new wave of leadership starts appearing in any number of places. Nasser joins this crowd of uh, early kind of nationalist leaders. Now, the, the, the part of what came with Nasserism was a kind of social contract with the Egyptian people that basically said the state will look after your basic needs. They, they did carry out land reform. There was some redistribution of wealth. But in return, uh, they also insisted that the populace basically support a one-party state that would be pretty uh, authoritarian. Uh, and this, again, was a very common pattern. Nasser became one of the, uh, the early exemplars of this kind of nationalistic, populist, authoritarian style of leadership. Not very tolerant for, of dissent, uh, but in many ways also very, I mean, probably Nasser would have won if there had been a free election because he actually did cater to the ordinary population's uh, interests. And for a lot of Egyptians, it was the first time in their history, in their modern history, that anybody had paid any attention to uh, people in the countryside, people in the pe Nasser himself was from a modest background. His father had been a postal, postal clerk. And so this was a social revolution as well as a political revolution. By the end of his life, Nasser uh, died in 1970. Uh, much of what he had set out to construct was in real disrepair. There was a lot of criticism of him uh, for the way he had managed the economy, which was uh, not growing very well. Uh, he had led Egypt into a disastrous war uh, with Israel in uh, 1967, uh, where his uh, Soviet-backed army was defeated in a matter of days, very humiliating to a lot of Egyptians. Uh, and the authoritarian nature of the regime was now no longer viewed as a source of strength and unity for the country, but rather a way of simply stifling any kind of critical voices. So by the time Nasser dies rather suddenly of a heart attack uh, in 1970, a lot of Egyptians are ready for um, something new. Uh, the something new is uh, significant. It, uh, it comes in the form of a uh, Nasser's vice president, who was not terribly well known at the time, uh, named Anwar Sadat, who in many ways initially presents himself as the successor to uh, Nasser. He's going to continue the same kind of policies. Uh, he's going to recover the, the lost territories from 1967. 
And indeed, he does lead uh, Egypt into a war uh, in 1973, a war that uh, turns out a little bit better than the 1967 war, quite a bit better. Uh, and then the, the great surprise with Anwar Sadat is that a few years after having led his country to war with, uh, with Israel, he actually makes peace with Israel. And we'll talk briefly about that. Uh, he, uh, two years after having done that, uh, in his own uh, right, uh, is uh, assassinated. Uh, this is uh, Sadat, a much, uh, uh, this particular image of him, a rather uh, cheerful looking uh, man. He, um, uh, he was a, a different kind of personality. He also shared with, with Nasser. He was about the same generation. He'd come out of the military, but did not have uh, identical views. He was much more willing to uh, see Egypt shift from being dependent on the Soviet Union uh, to having a closer relationship with the United States. In fact, within uh, a year or two of his coming to power, uh, he began to open uh, direct channels of communication to President Nixon and, and Secretary of uh, State Henry Kissinger. That was the time I was working in the government and one of my first uh, memories of having been in government was realizing that despite the fact that we had no diplomatic relations with Egypt at the time, that uh, by and large people still looked at Egypt as an ally of the Soviet Union, we were beginning to see that Sadat was sending a lot of signals that he was ready for a change. Uh, in the middle of 1972, he expelled uh, Russian military advisors. Uh, Kissinger and Nixon responded to that and said, well, you know, maybe it's time for us to start talking about resuming relations. And in 1973, uh, prior to the war that broke out that October, uh, there actually was the beginnings of a, a diplomatic relationship with Sadat. The war happened nonetheless. Sadat uh, was growing frustrated with the slow pace of diplomacy, uh, but it was not a war designed to uh, defeat Israel. It was a, a war, I think, designed to break the stalemate that had prevailed for several years and to give Sadat personally the kind of political legitimacy that would then make it possible for him to switch sides in the Cold War to the American side and to make peace with Israel, which he did. Uh, Sadat was a, uh, a man who was willing to also experiment with uh, <clears throat> opening up the political system a little bit. I don't want to exaggerate how much. Uh, he was still a dictator, but a more uh, tolerant uh, leader than Nasser had been in his last days, at least for a part of his regime. So the economy began to open up, uh, the political system began to open up a little bit. Uh, Egypt was, was certainly not uh, the harshest dictatorship in the Middle East in these days. It was the, uh, beginning to see uh, the first signs of a, a more liberal order. And of course, as uh, you can see here, these are the pictures of Sadat uh, with Jimmy Carter and uh, Prime Minister Menachem Begin of Israel at Camp David in 1978, and then the, the three of them when the peace treaty uh, between Egypt and Israel was signed in 1979, in the spring of 1979. Now this was an important breakthrough. Uh, this was the first Arab country that had agreed to make peace uh, with Israel, largest Arab country, uh, most powerful one. So in, in strategic terms, this was an extremely important shift. Uh, and Although the peace between Egypt and Israel has not been uh, robust and warm, it has endured up until today. It's still intact. Uh, the countries have, have never fought uh, since the 1973, and they still maintain uh, diplomatic relations to this day. Uh, this also was the moment when it became possible for the United States to begin to treat Egypt uh, not exactly as you know, we treat Israel as a very special kind of relationship, but we began to develop a very close relationship with Egypt, which included economic and military aid, uh, of course, tied to the peace treaty that Egypt had just signed with Israel. And that also has continued up until today, although it is under uh, some strain as, as is the overall relationship between the United States and Israel. Uh, as I mentioned, Sadat was, was killed, uh, was assassinated, uh, precisely by an Islamic extremist who blamed him for uh, 
both making peace with Israel, but also cracking down on the Islamic movement inside Egypt. Uh, and uh, he was then succeeded by Husni Mubarak. I'll show you a picture of him in a moment. Uh, and Mubarak then ruled Egypt from 1981 until just last year. So Egypt, modern Egypt has really had three leaders, all of whose names you should try to remember because they're, they're all important, Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak. And we just now uh, reached, uh, last year, we reached the end of the Mubarak era in very dramatic circumstances, which I will uh, talk about in a moment. What Mubarak brought to Egypt when he first came to power was a sort of sense that, that Egypt was returning to uh, being a somewhat more, uh, more normal place. Sadat was a very dramatic leader. He took the country to war, he made peace, he was very flamboyant. Mubarak was just the opposite. He was a very cautious, careful man. Uh, he stuck by the commitments that had been made. He maintained the peace with Israel, but there was no flamboyance to it. He maintained good relations with the United States, but discreet. Uh, and he rebuilt Egypt's ties with other Arab countries. Egypt had been more or less uh, banned from uh, Arab circles because of its peace with Israel. But as time went on, other Arab countries also made peace with Israel, Jordan in particular. The Palestinians began the process. Um, and it became easier for Egypt to kind of rebuild its ties to its, its neighbors. And for a lot of Egyptians, that was welcome. They, they were glad to kind of be back in, in good graces with their, their fellow Arabs. <clears throat> and I, I would say that in his first decade or two of rule, Mubarak would have been relatively well regard, <clears throat> regarded by most Egyptians. He carried out modest and gradual economic reforms, and by the 1990s, Egypt was beginning to see some real economic growth. So probably up through about the 1990s, uh, Mubarak was doing pretty well. Uh, he brought stability, he maintained the peace, he had good relations with most countries in the world, and the economy was beginning to grow. But any leader who stays in power for 20 years, and then 25 years, and then even longer, begins to raise questions in the minds of a lot of people. How long is this gonna go on? What's gonna happen when he goes? Uh, are we gonna always be treated as kind of children in our own country? We don't get to vote, we don't get to choose, we just get told that you know, daddy knows best and he's going to tell us uh, uh, how things are going to be done. This is a very patriarchal, uh, kind of soft authoritarian system under Mubarak. Uh, <clears throat> just to, to bring you into the, the kind of modern era, uh, Mubarak's Egypt uh, had a large population, not enormous by world standards, but by Middle East standards, it's one of the large countries, has about 80 million people, probably a bit more now. Uh, Cairo alone, if you, those of you who have been there, you know what a crowded and congested and actually quite dirty city it is, but a very exciting city. It's got at least 10 million people. If you take the larger uh, Cairo area, it's probably got about 15 million. It's an enormous, enormous city, uh, and it is the, the center of politics, of the economy, uh, uh, and of course of the, the recent political developments. The per capita income of Egypt is basically a relatively poor uh, middle level developed country. It's not poor in the sense of sub-Saharan Africa. You don't have starvation. Uh, you don't have desperate poverty. But it is a, a middle level, low middle level developing country. The figure that's given here of $6,000 uh, per capita income is, I don't want to get into the technical, technical detail, but this is in not actual dollars that you could get by exchanging your Egyptian pounds. These are called purchasing parity uh, equivalent dollars. That is, if you were to take your Egyptian income and buy bread and transportation and sort of a basket of goods and translate that into what it would be worth in the United States, this gives you the figure. Well, so they have a lot of things like price controls that keep things inexpensive in Egypt, but it does mean that the, the average Egyptian um, doesn't live very well, but they're not in desperate shape. Uh, in recent years, as there has been uh, economic growth, most of the growth has gone to the, uh, 
wealthy uh, part of the society, and that has created uh, considerable re resentment. The population is young, one of the factors that, that led to the revolts of the past year. Uh, literacy is, of course, by historic standards, is, is high. I mean, if you go back to the 19th century, you would have had literacy rates of maybe 5 or 10%. So one of the achievements of the modern state everywhere has been basic literacy is now uh, fairly commonplace. Most young children do get at least uh, uh, some education. Uh, but older Egyptians and particularly older uh, women are often illiterate. Uh, so Egypt is in the kind of mid-range of development with respect to things like longevity, literacy, and so forth. It is a heavily urban country by now. Uh, and uh, that also helps to uh, account for the recent uh, uprisings. There are a lot of people now concentrated in urban areas. Many of them are young, uh, partly and sometimes fairly well educated, and that's a, a combustible combination when there aren't very many jobs or very many opportunities or when the economy is going downhill, which it has been uh, in the last couple of years. This is uh, Mubarak, who presided over uh, uh, Egyptian uh, development for uh, the past 30 years. Uh, and I've been going to Egypt for about on an annual basis uh, since about uh, the 1980s or so. And already by about the mid-1990s, people were beginning to just say in casual conversation, I wonder when He's going to step down or be replaced or have a heart attack or whatever else. You know, and what will happen then? Uh, will it be another military man who simply takes over? Uh, will there be a chance for democracy? Uh, will it be you know, his son? Uh, in the recent the last five or six years, every time I would go to Egypt, people would say it's you know, it's so embarrassing. The only name that ever comes up in terms of who will su succeed him is his son, as if we're a monarchy. He said, you know, uh, why should, it, why should uh, power always have to pass from father to son? We had a revolution. We have a republic. That whole getting rid of the monarchy was meant to get away from that kind of politics. And yet it was pretty clear that Mubarak did have in mind uh, the possibility that it, it, he would step down this past year and he would then uh, try to organize the succession to go to his son. And there was a lot of resentment over that. A lot of people saying it shouldn't be that way, we should have a voice. Uh, it's time for uh, Egyptians to choose their own leaders. Uh, so, Egypt has gone through a major upheaval in the past year and a half. Uh, the, if you think back to January of uh, 2011, I'm sure many of you watched the pictures uh, as crowds began to uh, descend into the major squares, of, particularly of Cairo, but other cities as well, uh, demanding that Mubarak leave. And it was a very impressive and rather surprising uh, show of popular uh, sentiment spilling out into the streets and sustaining itself uh, in the face of pretty harsh repression. So what were the reasons for it? Well, the previous month, in December of 2010, something very similar had happened in Tunisia, triggered by the whole background factors of weak economy, again, a dictator who'd been there too long, the perception of corruption, and then a very tragic incident where a young Tunisian in a very desperate part of the country, one of the poorest parts of the country, uh, who was making a very minimal living by selling fruits and vegetables on the street, uh, was uh, told by a policeman that he wasn't going to be able to, to do this anymore unless he paid a bribe. He got himself a license, but it was basically asking for a bribe. And he was angered by this. He went to protest it and tried to see the local governor uh, to protest and he was turned away. And so he doused himself with kerosene and lit himself uh, fire and, and died uh, in this uh, dramatic self-immolation. And the pictures of this went viral all over the Middle East. It was a, a symbol of how desperate people had become and how angry they were with the corrupt systems they lived in. 
And immediately in Tunisia, people started going into the streets and demanding that their leaders change or reform. And it caught on like wildfire. It was on uh, Arabic television networks, which are widely seen. And within days, I started hearing people in Egypt say, I wonder who will be next. Tunisia's first. Their, you know, they, they, their guy was thrown out within a few weeks. Uh, the army sided with the Tunisian people. And the moment that happened, people saw it happen in Tunisia, Egyptians said, why not here? Why can't we do that? Are the Tunisians braver than we are? Or, you know, why can't we do that? So some young Egyptians said, let's try. Let's see if we can organize a protest on January 25th, which happened to be a holiday. It was called Police Day. It was supposed to be the day you honor the police. Uh, because back in 1952, the police had demonstrated against the British occupation, and the British had shot and killed a number of policemen. So this was a day to commemorate that historic event when the police were national heroes. And so these young kids figured this is a good day. Everybody's you know, out of school, and they got themselves organized, and they rather cleverly said, we're going to initially mobilize here, but of course the, then the police will come to you know, break up the demonstrations. So stay tuned on your iPhones and you know, whatever means of communication you have, and we'll tell you where to go next. And they played this little cat and mouse game, and within, by the end of the first day they found that instead of having just a few thousand people come out to demonstrate, they had tens of thousands of people in the streets with them, uh, and they said, let's do it again tomorrow and see if we can get more people to come out. And the next day, they had hundreds of thousands of people in the street. And it became a very, very dramatic uh, development. This is, these next few pictures will give you an idea of what was happening in the central square of Cairo called Tahrir Square. Uh, after about two or three days of this kind of cat and mouse game, there was a pitched battle all day long on January 28th. And the demonstrators finally forced the police to back down. They just kept coming in wave after wave after wave, and they ended up occupying this square uh, in downtown Cairo, Tahrir Square, which means Liberation Square. And they never gave it up. They, they stayed there overnight. Uh, people started coming and joining them uh, so that after a while you had uh, hundreds of thousands of people in this square. And they had real message discipline. They, the people came for all sorts of different reasons, economic grievances, political grievances, ideological commitments of one sort or another, but their slogans were very simple. It was, Mubarak must go. We, the people, should choose our own government, that is democracy. We want freedom and dignity. These were the, it, nothing about an Islamic state, nothing about death to Israel, nothing about down with America. This is very straightforward. Mubarak should go, we should choose our own leaders, we want freedom, we want dignity. Now, this was done very deliberately to create um, a consensus, you know, not to have you know, Christians over on one side worrying that the Muslims were going to be demanding Sharia law. Uh, all of that was you know, going to have to be addressed later. But for the moment, it was just Mubarak's got to go, we have to have the right to choose, uh, and we have to have human rights and things like that respected. So on that basis, really a huge number of Egyptians rallied to the side of the demonstrators, including the army. If that had not happened, the Egypt would look like Syria today. The big difference is that the, the Egyptian army decided that in order to preserve their own prerogatives, and they're a very powerful part of the uh, Egyptian state, they would jettison Mubarak and allow elections to take place and a new constitution uh, to be written. So they, on a very crucial day, sided with the people. The slogan at the time was, the army and the people are one hand. And for a brief moment, that seemed to be the case, and it was the key to persuading Mubarak to go. When he lost the support of the uh, the army, he had no longer a popular base. So this is an, a picture of the people with the army treating the army as their protectors, not as the enemy. Very different from what's going on in Syria today, where the army is 
you know, attacking uh, the people on behalf of the regime. Um, these are, uh, again, a few more pictures. You see a lot of pictures of uh, young people, older people, women, men, and so forth. So Mubarak uh, agrees to step down February 11th, and this opens uh, the way for the past year um, for a whole series of very complicated um, political developments, which I will try to briefly summarize, and then we'll have a chance for some discussion. Uh, basically, the military assumed executive powers, something called the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, with the support of a lot of people. I said, we do need order, we do need stability, as long as this is just an interim arrangement for the military to kind of oversee the process of elections and constitution writing, we can accept it. So originally the, the military, a shadowy committee of about 26 generals, assumes executive power and says we're going to have parliamentary elections in the fall. Uh, we're going to then have a constitution uh, that will be written by some kind of a process that wasn't very clear. Uh, and then in the early part of this year, uh, there would be presidential elections. And at the end of the, those presidential elections, the military would then turn over executive power to the newly elected uh, bodies, parliament and, and uh, president. So what has happened? Uh, it hasn't been a smooth process by any means. There have been a lot of bumps uh, in the road. There have been frag the, the initial uh, kind of young, enthusiastic group that, that set off the first demonstrations are probably the most bitter about f having kind of lost out in the recomposition of power. Not surprisingly, they're young and they don't have much experience. Uh, and they didn't have an obvious leader and you can't do everything with Twitter and Facebook. And uh, they found that politics is more than just organizing demonstrations and they weren't very good at the next phase of building institutions and getting people out to vote and so forth. So there's a lot of unhappiness on the part of those who feel that they helped to instigate this revolution. The big winners so far have been the military themselves. They've preserved their uh, position of power. Uh, they run the country today, although how much longer that will be, uh, we don't know. Um, and the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood was the long-standing opposition movement within the country. It was a tolerated movement. It wasn't uh, a legal political party, but everybody knew it was there. They had asserted their authority in a lot of the um, civil society groups. Uh, and they emerged um, in the midst of the, the uprisings against Mubarak. They joined the, the, the revolution on about the third day and brought to it a lot of, um, of, of energy. Uh, they were a very organized uh, movement and a very disciplined movement. And so once they had joined the revolution, it got both numbers and a certain um, momentum. So they emerged as an obvious contender for one of the, the largest political parties in the country, and they decided for the first time that they would contest uh, elections in the parliament under the name of a party, a newly named party called the Freedom and Justice Party, uh, which would have a, a Muslim Brethren agenda, but they consciously tried to uh, convince other Egyptians that they were kind of a, a new face of modern uh, Islamic uh, politics. They were going to be a moderate party. They weren't going to uh, try to uh, impose their views on everybody else, and they would not even seek uh, to contest all the seats in the parliament. They said, we don't want uh, to have too big a majority of our own, and we won't run a, uh, anybody for president. We don't want people to be afraid that we're going to take over everything. That was the initial uh, view. So the campaign for the parliament gets underway. Uh, voting took place in the fall. These are, uh, and it was really quite remarkable. This was against a backdrop of actually quite a bit of a breakdown of law and order. There had been some violence. There'd been a lot of unpleasant incidents. The day of the elections was perfect. Everybody showed up, about 70% turnout, which for Egypt was very good. People had to wait in line for hours and hours and hours to cast their vote, but they did so quite in a very orderly way. Men and women separate uh, in their, their lines. 
Notice in the women's line, you have one woman wearing the so-called niqab, the full face veil, which is still fairly rare in Egypt, although a little more common than it used to be. Very, this is the Saudi style of veiling. Uh, next to her is a woman with a Burberry you know, uh, coat or, or, or shawl or something looking you know, quite modern. And then this is the more traditional kind of veiling and then everything in between. Um, and that's, that's Egypt today. You have uh, people who, uh, in terms of their, their self-expression, will identify very closely with the Islamists, others who are very modern in their uh, appearance and attitudes and, and everything in between. Uh, this is the head of the military council, Field Marshal Tantawi, who is the, uh, probably the most powerful man in the country now, not particularly well loved these days. And these are more pictures of the uh, you know, woman voting and uh, the crowds uh, showing up to vote. So the elections took place peacefully uh, and produced an outcome that uh, all of my Egyptian friends, whether they like the outcome or not, viewed as uh, at least legitimate. Uh, it was an odd election. They had both party lists and individual lists. And on the individual lists, they would sometimes have hundreds of candidates. And since quite a few people are illiterate, they would have to give every single individual a symbol so that people could say, well, go vote for me. I'm the umbrella. That's, you know, or the, I don't know, the faucet, what a, you know, crazy. But when you've got hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, you've got to find things that are, it can't all just be palm trees and dates and crescents and pyramids and so forth. Although you have a few of those too. But look at this, a blender, what a, you know, amazing. A soccer ball, piano. So anyway, this is kind of a curious way of organizing the election. Uh, the results were, uh, whoops, let me. Um, before I get to the results of the election, let me show you the results of public opinion polls. Uh, these are uh, questions asked in recent months uh, whether uh, Egyptians believe that it was working to advance the gains of the revolution uh, or to slow uh, or reverse the gains of the revolution. Uh, had this poll been done right after the revolution, a lot of people would have supported the military, but the military has begun to lose support in the eyes of ordinary Egyptians, and many now see them as the obstacle. Uh, more generally, people were asked across the Arab world what they thought about the Arab Spring. Is this, does this make you more optimistic about the future or more pessimistic? And notice the, the overall, despite all the disruptions and chaos that has, has uh, accompanied the Arab Spring, most people feel more optimistic about the future. When asked about uh, why, uh, what the Arab Spring was all about, most Arabs say it was about people seeking dignity and freedom and a better life. Uh, some uh, see other motives behind it. But again, pretty strong support at the popular uh, level. When asked in Egypt, uh, what would you like your future, pre which foreign leader uh, would you like your new president to be most like? The answers are very interesting. The person they admire most is the current prime minister of Turkey. He is, of course, Muslim, but he's also a Democrat. Uh, and then look at you know, our poor president down here at 5%, Putin a, a little bit lower. Otherwise, you know, it's pretty uh, rough in between. Nobody else gets very much, but um, Erdogan is actually a pretty interesting choice. Uh, because a few years ago, that one would not have expected that. So the final results of the election uh, were a surprise in a couple of senses. Not that the Muslim Brethren got the largest number of seats. Everybody expected that they would get something like 30 to 40 percent of the vote. Uh, they got about 35 percent of the vote, and that gave them about 48 percent of the seats because of the nature of the electoral system. The big surprise was the second party. Uh, also an Islamist party, but a much more fundamentalist and conservative party called the Salafis. These are called Salafis. They're much more like Saudi Arabia style uh, Islamists. They're very strict. They don't want any mixing of uh, boys and girls in schools. They think women should not uh, have jobs uh, at the expense of men. You shouldn't allow 
uh, non-Muslims to run for president, uh, and so forth and so on. They ended up getting 28% of the seats in the new parliament. And this was a surprise because they had never been organized. Uh, they weren't very visible. Uh, but at the grassroots level, they were uh, present, and they did pretty well in the elections. All of the other parties that were more secular and liberal got about 24% of the seats, but divided across four or five parties. So the new parliament is very definitely uh, dominated by uh, Islamists, but the bulk of them are of this more moderate Muslim Brethren variety. Uh, when I was in Egypt in February, uh, this was the kind of graffiti that I was seeing on the walls saying, down with the military. Because at this point, people's attitudes had turned against the military. They thought that they were going to keep power for themselves uh, and that they would not allow this democratic process to uh, unfold. So this is actually a picture of Tantawi crossed out. This is, says the, uh, the mushir, the, the, the field marshal, no to the scaf, uh, no to, uh, to the Egyptian military. So this has caused a lot of tension. The military is now at odds with both the Muslim Brethren and with the more liberal groups. Uh, and the next stage in the development is uh, writing a constitution, which is starting just now, literally today. Uh, and the whole process has been extremely controversial. If you're reading the papers, you will have seen that a 100-person body was named, but uh, all of the, the so-called liberal uh, and Christian uh, members of that group have walked out because they say the, stack, the deck is stacked against them. Uh, so how the Constitution is going to be written and how it's going to be written in time for presidential elections to be held is anybody's guess. But by the end of May, there is supposed to be a presidential election uh, based on the new Constitution, uh, which will have been submitted to a referendum, uh, yes, no referendum of the people, uh, and the leading candidates, as of now, are two rather interesting uh, personalities. One is a man named Amr Musa, who uh, used to be foreign minister of, of Egypt under Mubarak, very much a member of the old order, but he took his distance from Mubarak early enough to have some credibility. Uh, and he served as Secretary General of the Arab League until about a year ago. And he's quite a well-known personality. He's also getting on in years, so people are not too worried that if he gets to be president, he'll be there for another 30 years. This is a guy who at most will serve one term. And he's probably the best known of the candidates who are going to attract significant support. Uh, the other person whom I don't, I, I do know him, I don't know this one, his name is Abul Munam Abul Futu, and he used to be a member of the uh, Muslim Brethren. In fact, he was on their so-called guidance committee. But he wanted the Muslim Brethren to evolve in a more open, uh, liberal way. He, Muslim Brethren's decision-making process is very closed to the outside. People don't know uh, <clears throat> how decisions are made. And he said, we should be more transparent, more accountable uh, to our own followers. And so he was actually expelled from the Muslim Brethren. And the Muslim Brethren don't want their followers to vote for him. But he has quite a bit of visibility as a uh, sincere believer. Uh, he is a medical doctor by training, but has written fairly widely about a kind of liberal version of Islam. And a lot of people who know him say he's a very decent guy who will attract support uh, from people who are not Islamists at all, including uh, Christians and uh, secular people, uh, because he is viewed as not corrupt. And he was willing to stand up to the kind of more authoritarian tendencies of the Muslim Brethren. So, all of this lies ahead, constitution writing uh, and presidential election. Will they make it or will this get knocked off the rails uh, between now and, and June? Uh, it's very hard to say, but so far with all the bumps in the road, Egypt has made a remarkable shift from the Mubarak era, which looked like it would just go on and on and on, to something that is very new. Um, people are no longer afraid to speak out. Uh, that's a big plus. Uh, there is a tremendous explosion of media, new uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, television channels, so that public discourse is much richer than it's ever been. 
Uh, there is, of course, a, a heavy weight of the new uh, political forces, Muslim Brethren in particular, who are now in their element. They have never been as visible or as powerful. And that worries some people, it reassures others, uh, and we simply don't know at this point how it's going to play itself out. Uh, the big question mark still in my mind is uh, how much power will the military relinquish? They have virtually a monopoly uh, of power still. They've promised that they will turn over much of this power, but it's hard to imagine them drifting off to the, into obscurity. This is a very large and powerful institution that still thinks of itself as the guardians of the state, guardians of order, and they have enormous vested interests in the economy. So there's going to be a negotiation over how much of that they keep, and I think they will keep quite a bit of it. And for some Egyptians, that will be the guarantee that the Muslim Brethren won't cross certain red lines. Others, it will be uh, a worrisome note because it will probably be at the expense of full-fledged uh, democracy. So I'm gonna stop at this point and entertain any questions or comments you would have. Uh, thank you, Professor Quant, for a most interesting um, educational and uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask the people who have questions if they would queue up here at this microphone so we can get them. And in order to uh, start it off, I'd like to ask Professor Quant uh, this question. It seemed to me that there was a key point in the revolutionary period where there was a consensus to uh, coalesce the ideas and point of the revolution. And I wanted to know, in your opinion, during the Arab Spring and as a result of the tensions existing previously, why did the Muslims not attack the Coptic Christian community? Well, first, the, the coexistence between Muslims and Copts in Egypt goes back actually a very long way. Uh, had, had there not been uh, some degree of tolerance uh, in previous uh, years, you wouldn't have 10% of the population of Egypt still being uh, Christian. So by and large, intercommunal relations in Egypt, while by no means perfect, have been much better than in, say, Iraq today, where there's almost, almost no Christian community left at all. Um, and Egyptians have rather prided themselves on uh, the fact that they've had this ability to coexist. Now, already under, in the last uh, months and last year or so of the Mubarak period, some communal tensions were, uh, were increasing. There was a very nasty incident in the um, months before the revolution began of a Christian church being attacked in, uh, in Alexandria, and, uh, but that was all during the Mubarak period. And there have been a couple of incidents in recent times. Uh, they often have to do with very local issues of, a, say, a Christian girl wanting to marry a Muslim boy and the families get into a huge dispute and one side or the other tries to go and, you know, abduct the, the girl and take her to one side. It, it has nothing to do with the government planning a pogrom, but it has to do with very local tensions flaring up and the police not doing anything to stop it. And those incidents have occurred. But just recently, I don't know if you, you may have noticed, the um, Pope of the Coptic Church, that's the, uh, the uh, Christian church in, in Egypt, died. He's a very elderly but respected man. And it was very interesting, all of the Islamic leaders went to pay respects uh, you know, before the funeral. And that's, that's very typical in, in Egypt, that you have uh, on both sides this, this desire to kind of keep things from getting too much out of hand. Uh, whether that can be sustained or not in a situation where the economy's in bad shape, uh, the Christians typically are wealthier than the Muslims, so there's some economic uh, resentment, the single richest man in Egypt is, uh, uh, is a Copt. Uh, he, he tried to organize a political party, which actually didn't do very well. Um, and he's quite critical. And so there, you know, things get kind of mixed up between class resentments and sectarianism. But by and large, there has never been um, a period of very, very deep uh, Christian versus Muslim uh, fighting in, in Egypt, unlike, say, in Lebanon or recently in Iraq. Of course, one of the themes of, of the Arab Spring 
in, uh, in Egypt and elsewhere is democracy. What is the attitude of the Egyptian people now uh, towards America? You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, I've, as I said, I've been going to Egypt for a long time, and I've never been in Egypt when our policies have been wildly popular. There have been moments when, like, just when the peace with Israel was signed, there was a lot of expectation this was going to be good for Egypt, which I think it was, and it was, it was pretty good to be an American in Egypt at that time. Uh, but usually, Egyptians have said, we like Americans, but we don't like your policies. And that still is the case. They don't like our foreign policies very well, but if you, most Americans who go there are very well treated, and I've, I've certainly never uh, felt the contrary. What's happened very recently that was unpleasant, and just in the last months, is that in you know, one of our periodic waves of enthusiasm, we want to teach people how to do democracy, which is kind of a noble ambition, I guess, but it's also kind of patronizing, as you guys obviously need to be taught by us. And so we took some of our aid to Egypt and gave it to uh, groups that were promoting democracy uh, in Egypt. And in this rather chaotic period after the revolution, some of it wasn't done with a lot of sensitivity. Money was being spread around very quickly, unaccountably, and the groups doing it hadn't been formally authorized to do this. So just recently, this all blew up in a legal case in which um, the, the courts in Egypt said that uh, these American groups were operating illegally and that the people who were involved with them uh, would be put on trial. And they, meanwhile, they couldn't leave the country. And that led to a very tense moment. That was in full flower when I was there in February. Uh, they've now allowed the people to leave, but it left a very bad feeling on the Egyptian side. They felt that you know, we weren't respecting uh, the Egyptian law, and on the American side, there was a real irritation that you know, we give you all this aid, and this is what we get in return for, for it. So right now, the relationship is, is more strained than it's been in a long time. But there's a very... I met with the foreign minister when I was there recently, and it was clear to me that uh, he's not a terribly powerful figure, but he was very, very eager to say, look, we've got to get over this. We don't want to breach in the relationship. We are trying very, very hard to keep on good terms with you know, Israel, with the United States, with our neighbors. This is no time for Egypt to have foreign policy problems. And I think for uh, the military, that's obviously the case. They get over a billion dollars a year from the United States to buy military equipment. They don't want to breach. At the popular level, we're not real popular right now. Uh, Obama was two years ago when he went to Cairo. He was viewed uh, as, as almost a folk hero, but people became very disappointed with him very quickly because they didn't see the, the soaring rhetoric that they heard in his speech get translated into anything practical. Uh, my questions were about these NGOs that um, are on trial. And um, I just wonder if you could comment on what you think went behind the closed doors when uh, Clinton and I guess Obama decided to give the full amount of money to uh, the army rather than withhold it as the con our Congress had wanted. Uh, I, I can't say that I know entirely, but I think when we worked out the arrangement for the uh, seven Americans were, were holed up in the American embassy. Uh, they were allowed to leave with a posting of bail. One of them actually refused to leave. He said, I'm going to stay and go on trial with my Egyptian colleagues. I'm not going to leave the country. And he's treated as kind of a folk hero in Egypt. But all the rest of them left. Uh, I think it was part of the deal that if you let them leave uh, and essentially let the issue lie dormant for a while, uh, we will, on our side, also calm those who are calling for an end to aid or the conditioning of aid, at least for this round of, of uh, appropriations. And so I think it was all part of the deal that got the uh, Americans out. And uh, that, uh, in, what Hillary Clinton had to do, uh, since she was not able to, in good conscience, say that uh, Egypt was unquestionably on track for democratization, which was what she was supposed to certify she exercised for this time uh, 
the, uh, a waiver, which says she doesn't have to certify it, but the aid can go forward. But this will come up every year. This is, we're not over with this one. But I think this was the payoff to the regime to say, let's, you, you calm down on your side, we will calm things down on our side. You guys have to get through your elections, your constitution writing, we'll revisit all of these issues a few months from now. Thank you. Next, please. And I think it was the right decision. Um, I have a question that looks at the role of the army. Uh, I'm a newly minted American citizen uh, coming from Europe. And uh, we in Europe um, took the view that the reason the military did not intervene during the protests was partly due to the fact that many of the military leadership had been trained, ed educated, or visited the American military academies, therefore had a strong uh, connection to our way of doing business, and uh, that maybe even the uh, U.S. government via the U.S. leadership in the military was able to influence the, the Egyptian military and say, come on, uh, you've got to defuse this if you side with the protesters, we will avoid something like that's happening in Syria. And connected to that, the question, one of the reasons, at least that's the European view, the German view in this case, um, that the Americans, uh, the American political system is disliked right now, is the support, the continuing support for the military. Well, it's an excellent observation, and I think you're, you're pretty much on target. Um, the only thing I would add is that the military, well before the events of January, had made a preliminary decision that they would not support the president's, President Mubarak's attempt to have his son succeed him. That if that were announced, and they thought it would happen this past summer, uh, they would make clear that they opposed it, they expected that there would be demonstrations against it, and that they would then side with the demonstrators. They had, that had already been envisaged. So when the protests began in January, they were caught by surprise. But they had already made the preliminary judgment that we're not going to support Mubarak to the bitter end, uh, particularly because of the succession problem. So they didn't have to be pushed very hard to side with the popular protest against Mubarak. What did happen, uh, and we, we, didn't, we never conduct our policy very elegantly, but surprisingly, um, the military did pretty well. The American military did pretty well. From early on, uh, with encouragement from the White House, they were told to contact their counterparts in Egypt and say basically two things. Don't use force against the people. The moment you do that, if you do, you will be using American military equipment against the Egyptian people, and we will be obliged to cut off aid, either because we think you shouldn't be doing it or Congress will make us do it. It's just we can't continue to aid an Egyptian military that's shooting at its own people. So don't shoot at your own people. And I know that message was. And then at the crucial moment that it became clear that Mubarak could not survive this uprising, um, the military said, and we think Mubarak should go. And they told that to their military counterparts. So I think it, it did have some impact, but I also think the Egyptians, Egyptian military had decided in advance that they were going to side with the people in this phase. Now, should we continue to support uh, the Egyptian military? Uh, if we don't, we lose some influence over a powerful player in the Egyptian political arena. Uh, they're not our puppets, even though they trained in American military academies, but they are, they tend to be more secular and business-like and interest-oriented. Um, and I think they're going to be around as a powerful player. And I personally think that we have an interest in maintaining that relationship. I don't think it should be the only relationship we have in Egypt. I think we need to learn to talk to the Muslim brethren. It's, not easy after years and years of not practicing, uh, but recently Lindsey Graham, who is no great fan of Muslim 
uh, leaders went to Egypt and he was trying to get these Americans out. And he said, the only person that I could get a straight answer from was the head of the Muslim Brethren. I went and explained our problem. He said, I'll get you an answer in two hours. And he did. He said, I think these are people we can do business with. And there is a kind of business-like, these are not people who are religious scholars. This isn't Iran. These are engineers and doctors who happen to be personally pious and have joined this, this movement. But uh, there is a kind of business-like side to the Muslim Brethren that makes it possible to do business with them, to talk to them. And that's going to be hard for us to get to used to, but we will. I don't believe you mentioned the name Farouk in your presentation. And those of us of a slightly older generation uh, recall or remember that. And more importantly, what is your opinion of how the Egyptian people feel about the great disparity between what the United States gives Israel versus Egypt? Well, uh, I didn't mention Farouk because very few Egyptians care one whit about him today. He sailed off into the sunset and lived out his life on a bar stool in Nice and uh, never, <laughs> never uh, looked back. Uh, he wasn't a terribly popular figure when he was overthrown. Uh, uh, the other question, however, is, is, is important. The uh, Egyptians, of course, do see uh, our relationship with Israel uh, in, in a negative light. Uh, they think we pamper them, we allow them to get away with all kinds of things that, that are not very popular in the Arab world or the Muslim world. And for some of them, there is this notion that once Egypt made peace with Israel, it was more or less guaranteed equal treatment with Israel, which was actually never quite part of the deal, but that's the way Sadat kind of sold it to his own people. He said, we will you know, become uh, as important for the United States uh, as Israel. And so a lot of Egyptians will say, well, America has never treated us that way. You know, per capita uh, aid is, is a tenth of what it is to, to Israel. And Israel is a very wealthy country. They get all the m more economic aid today than Egypt does. So there is some resentment. On the other hand, by now, most people just accept it as that's, that's American politi politics. And there are a few Egyptians who say we'd be better off without any American aid. Uh, however, I haven't heard too many people say recently that they want it cut. Um, but uh, there, there is some feeling that Mubarak um, became too much of an American puppet in return for the aid that he got. And that uh, one of the sources of his loss of popularity was the view that Egypt is no longer capable of kind of acting in its own national interest because it's tied by this string to the United States. So some Egyptians who are more nationalistic say we'd be freer to pursue our interests uh, without American aid. The military doesn't, un, doesn't go along with that because they know that the moment the aid is cut, uh, their position uh, in the country actually becomes much weaker very quickly. Um, my question also has to do with Israel, but more directly, how do you see the relationship between Egypt and Israel playing out uh, politically as well as economically? They are direct neighbors. You know, the, the relationship has been um, intact now since the peace treaty was signed. It's had moments when it's been warmer and moments when it's been cooler. It's in a cool phase now, but the relations have not been broken. Uh, there are communications, particularly between the military and, and the Israelis, uh, particularly about issues in Sinai, which is a very kind of wild west zone where there's, there's a lot of uh, potential for problems. Um, I don't think in present circumstances the relationship is going to get a lot better anytime soon, but it's very interesting that both the Muslim Brethren and actually the Salafi party, the, the more hardline Islamist party, have said that they will support all of Egypt's international agreements. And they mean by that the peace treaty with Israel. Uh, nobody, no political party uh, that is in the current parliament has said anything other than that. And I think they realize that it would be a very, very reckless move. Um, but uh, I will just repeat, the, the current uh, 
Egyptian perception of Israel is, is a pretty negative one. Uh, there hasn't been any movement on, on the peace front. The war in Gaza that took place at the end of 2008-2009 uh, was vividly uh, portrayed in the Egyptian media uh, as an assault upon uh, basically a civilian population. Uh, and uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of anger about that, that Egypt had to sit by and do nothing uh, because it's tied to the peace treaty and it's dependent on the United States and it uh, sort of had to sit by and watch uh, Palestinians be killed by uh, Israelis. So there's a lot of, a lot of that kind of undertone. Um, and the Palestinian issue uh, periodically does flare up. People will uh, express uh, their support. Um, and it, it just kind of eats away at the, the, the lack of any progress on that front does eat away at the Egyptian-Israeli relationship. Nonetheless, I think interests will keep them from going very much further toward a deterioration of the relationship. It will remain a cool piece. It just won't warm up anytime soon in the absence of, of the broader Arab-Israeli conflict getting back on track, our peace process getting back on track. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Uh, this has been truly a, uh, a, a remarkable presentation, bringing us up to date on uh, not only the history, but the current events. And we're truly honored. And thank you very, very much, Professor You're welcome. for bringing us this presentation. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I want to uh, also announce that next week, a week from today, Professor Alan Lynch will be talking to us on Russia. Thank you for coming and enjoy your day. Thank you so much.